Good evening, Vernon. Welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 and our lockdown lecture series, meeting number 63. It's a great pleasure as ever to welcome you all along here in this virtual environment of the world of Zoom. As ever, Bern, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines? Please keep your camera on and a recognisable name uh, within the video box. If you do have a challenge with your bandwidth, please let me know. Uh, however, I can recommend uh, a nice sky upgrade. I went from four megabits per second to 55 megabits per second and a five pound monthly discount. And thanks to brother Colin Thompson for the, the advice and guidance on that. It uh, also means my upload speed uh, really improved as well. Uh, so you might get the YouTube a lot earlier uh, this evening, Brian, so you don't have to wait up to past midnight. Uh, Brian, can I also remind you and ask you, please to sign our virtual tile on our Facebook page. That is very much appreciated. Well, Brian, uh, many of you may have uh, watched the Sky History programme uh, about Oak Island and the, the, the challenges that the, the Lagina brothers, Rick and Marty, uh, have put themselves through over the last few series. Is, uh, Certainly, they've spent a huge amount of money that we might hear a bit about tonight. Uh, but it's a great pleasure to welcome Brother Stephen Harrison uh, to join us this evening. Stephen's a past master and fellow of the Missouri Lodge of Research. He received his Masonic degrees in Liberty Lodge number 31 in Liberty, Missouri uh, in 1999. And he served as its master in 2003 to 2004. For a decade, he was editor of the Missouri Freemasons magazine. And in addition, he's contributed to several other Masonic publications, including his own work as a regular contributor to the respected Midnight Freemasons blog. And Bern, if you've not uh, had a look at the Midnight Freemasons blog uh, online, I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, Steve's also authored a variety of uh, Masonic books, uh, Freemasonry Crosses the Mississippi, Freemasons Tales from the Craft and Freemasons at Oak Island. And it's that subject we're going to hear about this evening. Uh, Steve lives, uh, is retired after 35 years in the information technology uh, arena. Uh, that's something that Alan Maitland uh, would struggle to, to understand, uh, Alan. That's a computers and communication, sir. Uh, and he, he lives in the Kansas City area. Uh, of the United States. And Brother Steve Harrison, it's a great pleasure to welcome you along here to the Lodge Hope of Karachi. And sir, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, the first thing I'm going to try to do here, uh, and it may be the toughest thing to get through, is to show you guys what's on my screen. So I'm going to give that a try right now. Um, if I do this, And we can see your uh, desktop. You can see some things, can't you? Now, if I go here and try this. Yep, that's your first page. Too. See it? Yep. Okay, well, maybe the 35 years in technology paid off. Um, <clears throat> let me just start out uh, by saying that you, you talked about the History Channel program which I understand is, is a Sky Channel program, and I am assuming that it's the same thing. Uh, they have been doing this over here for several years, and I always just have to say that um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get this idea from them. I was researching this well before they started. So as we go through this, um, I, I know from watching that show and from the research that I have done that there is a, there's a whole lot of uh, speculation that about what really is happening on Oak Island. So I need you to help me out because if I make a statement that sounds like it's absolutely cast in stone, I don't really need, mean to do that. And what I really mean to do is say that something happened allegedly, because as I say, there is so much speculation about what's going on there. And the other thing that I will say is I'm pretty much sticking to how things on Oak Island relate to Freemasonry, 
because I know there's other speculation about what may have happened there and where that treasure came from. We'll talk about a couple of those things, but we really need to narrow it down to Oak Island and Freemasonry. Now, as to how I got a start in this, um, uh, several years ago, I believe it was 2004, 2005, a movie came out here in the States, and I'm sure you saw it too, and it starred Nicolas Cage, and the title of the movie was National Treasure. And a quick recap, Nicolas, Page, uh, Nicolas Cage played this guy who was going to go out and find this great buried treasure, and there was a map to it on the back of the Declaration of Independence, and he chased the bad guys, and the bad guys chased him, and they finally wound up finding this incredible treasure. And of course, the Freemasons had been the stewards of the treasure all along, and it had this happy ending and even pretty much put the Freemasons in a, in a good light. So at the time uh, where I was doing con some consulting, people knew I was a Freemason and they would come to me and, you know, kind of jab me a little bit. And their question was always, Steve, where do you Freemasons really have your treasure buried? Um, at the time, I had only heard of Oak Island, but I would always tell them we have it buried at Oak Island. Fact is, I just did not know what I was talking about. About three things I did not know about Oak Island. I did not know where it was. I didn't know what was supposed to be there. And I didn't know why there were any Masonic connections to Oak Island. So we're going to cover those three things today. Some of them are going to be pretty easy to cover. Because where is Oak Island? We can tell you that immediately. Oak Island is located about 45 miles southwest of Halifax, Nova Scotia. And it looks, if you look at it on this map, you can't even see it. It's just a tiny little dot of an island that looks like this, kind of maybe even like an elephant or something. It's very small, located in Nova Scotia. So that takes care of the where is Oak Island. What is supposed to be buried there? Um, anything and everything, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, Solomon's treasure. There may be other things. In fact, people have claimed there are other things buried there. And we'll take a look at a couple of them, but there's one more thing you need to keep in mind that may be buried on Oak Island. And it is a possibility that there is absolutely nothing buried on Oak Island. Now, as most, uh, most things of this nature, there is a legend associated with Oak Island. The legend is that before the secret of Oak Island is revealed, there will be no oak trees left on the island. Oak trees, by the way, are not indigenous to Oak Island. And the other part of the legend is before the secret can be revealed, seven people must die in, uh, in pursuit of the treasure. To date, there is one oak tree that we know of left on Oak Island, and there have been six lives lost in pursuit. So according to the legend, we're getting close. <clears throat> uh, the rest of it is not quite so easy to dig out. Why do we think there are Masonic connections to what is buried on Oak Island? So I'm going to run through the sort of the beginnings of Oak Island and what happened to make people think there's a treasure buried there and then take it from there as to some of the attempts that have been made to get that treasure out of there. In the year 1795, a guy by the name of Daniel McGinnis was walking along on Oak Island and he found three trees uh, in triangular formation sitting over a sort of circular depression in the ground. And he looked up in one of the trees that was overhanging that depression and he saw a block and tackle. And he said, hmm, I think there might be something buried here. 
And in addition to that, on those trees that were surrounding this circular depression were Masonic markings carved into the tree. So he said, we've got to investigate this. And he ran and he got some friends of his, a guy by the name of John Smith and an, another man by the name of Anthony Vaughn. I say man, we speculate that they were in their late teens or early 20s. And they brought their tools and they started digging where they saw that hole. They dug down about three feet and they ran into a, laver, a, a layer of flagstones that was covering this entire hole. And they pulled those flagstones up and they continued to dig. When they got down to the 10 foot level, they found a layer of oak logs stretched entirely across this hole that they were digging. At the level of 10 feet, they hauled those local oak logs up and they kept digging. And when they got down to 20 feet, they found another layer of oak logs. And then when they got to 30 feet, they found another layer of oak logs. If you've ever done any digging at all, you know that this is just backbreaking work. Not only did they have to do the digging, but they also had to get those heavy logs up. And at this point, they would have to carry them up 30 feet. Taking a look at the amount of work involved, they did what just about anybody would do. They gave up. They didn't think about it much anymore, but it was kind of in the back of their minds. And for several years, they just let the whole thing sit until sometime around 1803, one of the guys, um, Vaughn, had some contacts at the Onslow Company, which was a dredging company, and they had digging equipment. And he, he approached them and said, you know, you might want to come out and take a look at this place. We think there's a treasure buried there. So the Onslow Company came out and they set up their digging equipment and they started to dig. They found things like coconut fiber and obviously coconut trees do not grow on an island near Nova Scotia. So they knew, they knew somebody had been there with something and coconut fiber was used as packing material in those days. So they said, well, somebody's been here and we think we're on to something. They continued to dig. Every 10 feet, just like the boys had found, they found a layer of oak logs across that entire dig. So they hauled those logs up until they got to a level of 90 feet. There were logs at 90 feet, but there was also this. It was a, it was a flat stone that had strange markings on it. And they took a crowbar and kind of pounded on the stone. And they, it, they could tell that it sounded like there was, it was hollow underneath. And they really, really thought that now they had found something. So they pulled the stone up and took it up and it was the end of the day. The stone itself, and this is a replica because the cipher stone seems to be missing these days, looked pretty much like what you see here. Of course, they could not read the inscription on the stone. Uh, people at a later date have determined that it may say 40 feet below, 2 million pounds lie buried. So again, thinking they were on to something, they stayed overnight, came back to the hole the that they had dug the next morning, and this is what they saw. The entire dig had filled up with water. They immediately suspected that there was something buried down there and that they had hit a booby trap. And the booby trap, they speculated, worked kind of like a soda straw, uh, that there was a, a route to the sea, and then there was the tunnel that they were digging into. And when they lifted the stone, the water, just like in a soda straw, if you put your finger down on top of it, put it in some water, and then lift your finger, the water will rush in. They assumed that the same thing had happened there 
and it was all now covered with water. They couldn't go down any farther. And that is when the Onslow Company gave up. Now, over the last 200 years of history with this place, uh, there have been a number of people that have come in and tried to get that treasure and all up to now to no avail. But some of the people that have come in to work on this place have in fact been Freemasons that we would know about. Richard Byrd did a stint there for a while. Uh, he was just up there on his own that we know of, but he maintained an interest in the dig. John Wayne, the movie star, uh, actually formed a company that came up and did some digging up there. He also maintained an interest. And then none other than Franklin Roosevelt uh, became interested in it. And he came up and physically helped with the dig in the years before he, be, he uh, contracted polio. And he also maintained a lifelong interest in what was going on at Oak Island. Some of the other companies that came to Oak Island dug up some really interesting stuff. One company that uh, did a dig, and, and mind you, these are not, what they're really doing is they're putting equipment out there and they're drilling cores because the water was still in the hole and all they could do was drill the cores. So they would drill down bring the core up, open it up, and see what was in there. They found at the 125 foot level, three little gold links, as you see depicted on the bottom left of your screen. Then, as they dug down farther, they found a layer of seven inches of cement at the 153 foot mark. Three feet below that, they found a piece of parchment that had been treated with mercury. And then down at 160 foot level, they found seven more inches of cement. Now, what they're speculating here with the cement and then dirt and parchment and whatever else they found and then followed on by cement, they were certain they had dug into a stone vault that contained those items. So that was one of the significant things that was found during that time. Um, another company, as they were digging down there, actually found what they thought was some form of doorway right near the, uh, what we're now calling the money pit, uh, that looks kind of like what you've seen on the screen now. And, um, it had an iron ring in the middle of it, and they figured it had to be associated with something that had to do with this dig. Further, um, you can see a list here of some of the other things that occurred during that time and some of the things that happened at Oak Island. I would highlight a couple. Number one, you can see in, in yellow there, <clears throat> the dates of the people who died attempting to get the, the treasure from Oak Island. The most recent of which was in 1965, where in one day, workers di digging in what they call borehole 10, which is located across the little path or street from the water filled um, money pit, they were digging down there and some gas escaped and it turned out to be poisonous and they'd all died, four of them together before people could get them out of the hole. Uh, another significant thing you might want to key in on was that in 1850, they figured out that the beach on the, on the very east side of the island is not a natural occurrence. They found out that it is uh, uh, an artificial beach and they thought it might have something to do with the booby trap. So when they found that beach, they said, well, let's see if we can test this out. If we took some red dye and we poured it into what we're now calling the money pit, 
eventually that red dye should sort of float out through the booby trap and it should come out, we believe, at Smith's Island on, or Smith's Cove, I'm sorry, on the east side of the island. Smith's Cove is also called Smuggler's Cove. So they tried that. They poured the red dye in there and they waited a while and sure enough, the red dye started coming out on the east side of the island there at Smith's Cove. However, the red dye then also started coming out on the south side of the island and the southeast side of the island. So thinking when it was coming out at Smith's Cove that they had discovered maybe a booby trap, now they know they've either discovered a very elaborate uh, booby trap or possibly just porous soil. So that kind of takes care of some of the digs that have gone on. What we want to look at now is, and I, I want to stick to Freemasonry, but just a little bit of some of the other theories about what people think may be buried on Oak Island that, that doesn't really involve uh, the Freemasons. And you can read them there, um, a Mayan treasure. Some people think it's Captain Kidd's pirate's treasure. Uh, some people think it is just a tomb. There is a theory that Shakespeare did not write all of his manuscripts, that he had uh, help from Francis Bacon, and the manuscripts are buried there, and, and a whole host of other speculation that some have even said may have something to do with outer space aliens. So we have run the gamut on the speculation as to what might be buried at Oak Island in addition to, you know, Solomon's treasure or something that uh, the Freemasons may have brought there. Now, let's go and take a look at the theory about how the Knights Templar may have gotten this treasure to Oak Island. We all know who the Knights Templar were. Uh, they were a very powerful, almost military uh, group associated with the church who helped people in traveling to the Holy Land. They became very wealthy. They established the first banking system in, in Europe. Uh, as they would conquer their enemies, they would of course plunder their riches. They became very wealthy. They became very powerful and King uh, Philip of France and the Pope at the time be sort of became leery of the Knights Templar, knowing that they were very rich, very powerful, and they, they, were, they, they not only were, I guess you would say, afraid of them, uh, they also uh, wanted to get their hands on the wealth of the Knights Templar. So they dreamed up all kinds of hideous charges about the Knights Templar, and they started to round them up, imprison them, torture them, burn them at the stake. And it was not a good time to be a member of the Knights Templar in France. Put yourself in their position. You're a Knight Templar. They're torturing your buddies, imprisoning them, killing them. You might consider wanting to get out of the country. And not only that, you know where the treasure's buried. So you and a few of your friends go grab that treasure and you head to the North Shore of France, which is the speculation as to what happened. So they went to the North Shore of France and then there are a couple theories. The first theory is that they brought that stuff up very close to where you're located today, a place called Roslyn Chapel. And then many years later in 1398, the caretaker of Roslyn Chapel, Henry Sinclair, figured he didn't have a good enough hiding place for the treasure at Roslyn Chapel, so he headed west with the treasure. Another theory just says the Knights Templar got to the northern part of France, took off, and sailed west. Either theory, you got to know where people think they were going. 
right there to Oak Island. So that, that is the, the theory as to how the Knights Templar may have gotten the Oak Island treasure, in fact, to this little island off of Nova Scotia. Um, there are some holes in the theory. The Knights Templar were not exactly scientists. Uh, there was the thinking in those days, it's pre-Columbian, there was the thinking that if you sailed far enough west into the, into the ocean, you would drop off the face of the earth. So we don't know that they would have wanted to make that journey or not, but that sort of wraps up the, the way the Knights Templar may have gotten this treasure over to Oak Island. Next thing I want to take a look at is the story of Enoch. We don't know too much about Enoch. Uh, he is only mentioned six times in the Bible. He was the seventh man from Adam, the great grandfather of Noah. Uh, Enoch was known by God to be a very good man, and God wanted to reward him for this. So in a dream, God transported Enoch into the clouds, where there, as a reward, he whispered the ineffable name into Enoch's ear, and then he wrote it in the clouds. After that, God transported Enoch down into nine subterranean arches, the very bottom of which was lined in stone, and there he showed Enoch the ineffable name written on an alabaster stone. When Enoch awoke, he was so impressed by what had happened to him, he actually built those arches, or chambers, if you want to call them that. On top of, uh, on top of his construction, uh, he built an altar of unhewn stone, and down at the bottom, as he had seen, uh, he lined the very bottom uh, arch or um, chamber with stone itself. Now, if you, if you take that whole story and you superimpose it over uh, our 13th degree here in the Scottish Rite in the United States, um, you will find three men who actually take a journey down into those chambers and they recover that stone that has the ineffable name written upon it. Also, in the seventh degree of our York Rite here, uh, the same three men travel down into those chambers where they discover a pot of manna, Aaron's rod, and the book of the law. So, keeping that in mind, let's go back and let's take a look at the structure of the money pit at Oak Island. In a cutaway, you can see all these places that things have happened. Uh, starting at the very top, you can see where the young men discovered the flagstones. You can see at 10 foot levels, the layers of oak logs that everybody discovered all the way down to the very bottom. You can see where the McGinnis party stopped digging, where the water has risen to. And then down at the 90 foot level, you can see where they discovered that cipher stone that we talked about. And uh, also where the Onslow company stopped digging. And then the very bottom, you see the cement vault that uh, another company was supposed to have drilled into and that they uh, allegedly thought was down at the bottom of the money pit in Oak Island. Now, having all that put together, let's take a look at some uncanny coincidences between the legend of Oak Island, what is supposed to have taken place there, the Knights Templar, Enoch, and the structure of Oak Island. Coincidences. Um, first of all, Oak Island itself was discovered by three men. And in the 13th degree of the Scottish Rite and the 7th degree of the Royal Arch, we have three men exploring 
Enoch's chambers. The Oak Island it, was discovered in a triangular setting of three trees. And at the bottom of the um, of Enoch's chambers, we had the ineffable name of God resting on a triangular pedestal. I should point out, these are not theories that I came up with. These are comparisons that have been made over the years. At the top of what we're calling the money pit was that grove of trees with Masonic markings on uh, carved into them. And as we mentioned at the top of Enoch's nine chambers, he also had some cryptic markings placed on a stone and a column. At the very top, the boys had dug down three feet and they discovered a layer of flagstones, unhewn stones. Enoch, at the top of his construction, constructed an altar of unhewn stones. Down at the bottom, uh, Enoch had built a stone vault lining the entire bottom chamber with stone. And down at the bottom of Oak Island, we have discovered a stone vault, we believe. There are nine chambers to what Enoch constructed. And if you look over at the structure of Oak Island, count them, there are nine chambers. People have compared the book of the law, the parchment that it would have been written on with the parchment that was discovered within that stone vault when they did the core drilling at Oak Island. Then in the York Rite, we notice that there's the similarity that when, when the Onslow company got down to the 90 foot level, they took a crowbar and they pounded on that cipher stone and they found it to be hollow beneath it. And then right from our Masonic uh, ritual in the Royal Arch, at length, one of my companions struck with his crow what seemed to be an impenetrable rock, but which gave forth a hollow sound. Finally, whoops, uh, there is the door that they discovered and anytime you see a depiction of those men going down into those chambers in the Masonic degrees, you almost always see a similar stone door with a ring in it right there in the picture. And then to wrap it up, all of Enoch's construction was destroyed by the Great Flood. And it is very possible everything that was down at the bottom of Oak Island was destroyed by a flood. So keep those coincidences or parallels in mind as we take a look at some of the rest of this. But if you don't, if you're not too convinced about the Knights Templar theory and the coincidences and all that's going on there, we could just look at some other Masonic connections to what's going on on Oak Island. In 1967, Dan Blankenship, we'll hear a little bit more about him, was riding along in a bulldozer on the east side of the island, and he overturned a stone with the letter G in it. Now, we don't have a franchise on the letter G, but it could be that that was used for Masonic meetings right there on the island. They've also discovered a rock with a point within a circle carved into it. Again, we're not the only people that use that, but it is in fact a Masonic symbol. Over in uh, Smugglers or Smith's Cove, they found a heart-shaped stone and they've had that looked at. And people who know what they're talking about have said, this is absolutely not a natural phenomenon. Somebody has carved this stone to look like a heart and it brings to mind uh, the sword pointing toward the naked heart. Something very interesting on the south side of the island that was discovered was a series of stones 
laid into sort of a triangular shape that points directly to the money pit. Um, it, you can see the location marked there where they found this thing. And this right here is the only known picture of that triangular uh, configuration. Now, if you look at it there, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, that is where the triangle is supposed to come in. And that's what it looks like. Again, the only picture of, of that uh, uh, triangular whatever you want to call it, that uh, anybody has ever had, but it does point toward the money pit. If you look at Oak Island from the air, you can see a cross. It's, uh, those those uh, markers are pretty far apart. They have found by exploring uh, stones, four of them that look exactly like the stone you see on the right, placed in this fashion to look like a cross. And then in the center of it is a stone that looks like it has a head carved into it. So that could be a reference to the Knights Templar. Of course, you've also got uh, the cipher stone itself. And a lot of people would say, well, if it's got cryptic markings on it, it must be Masonic. There are triangles on there. There's a point within a circle and other uh, markings that very well may point to the Freemasons. In addition, and we've even seen this on the History Channel show, uh, they have found Masonic tools on the island. So we are, we're pretty sure that the Freemasons have uh, been there at one time or another, and the tools do keep popping up from time to time. In um, I'm sorry, 1863, somebody discovered what they thought were a series of buttons uh, down on the east side of the island near Smith's Cove. And um, there was a, a, a reporter for the Halifax Morning Sun, who in fact was a Freemason, and he identified what they found in fact as Masonic jewels. If you look at the uh, map of the island, we, we really have to at least mention this borehole 10x that they have dug across from the money pit. Why did they do that? Well, the money pit, don't forget, was filled with water. So they decided at one point to dig a hole next to the money pit to try to get, get down to the depth where the money pit ended and where the treasure might be, and then to go across laterally to see if they could find the treasure that way. And that's why Borehole 10 is there. They have found a number of things uh, down in Borehole 10 or suspected things. Um, number one, they, they thought they had found an ax down there. They thought they might have found a treasure chest and they even thought they might have found a body. Problem is, just like the money pit, borehole 10X has now filled with water. So here are your characters, your men who are digging on Oak Island. I need to be clear that when I first did this research, there, um, there was not a lot of information at all about what was going on on Oak Island for many, many years. And it was really kind of a dead end. The only thing I could find were some um, oh, uh, radar maps uh, where they had tried to pump radar down into the ground and make the maps and see if they could find anything that was down there at all. And they were not at all helpful. So the Lagina brothers on the History Channel, on the Sky Channel came along and decided that they wanted to follow up on this. And the simple fact is I'm really glad they did because if for the first time I was getting information from Oak Island that had just been a dead end before. Now, Dan Blankenship has been digging there or had been digging there since the early 60s. At the time they started the show there, uh, he was one of the crew, uh, 90 some years old. 
he didn't do a whole lot of the heavy lifting, but he was out with them several times. But within the past couple of years, he has passed away. He's still a hero of mine for getting out there and working at the age of the mid 90s or however old he was. Now, if we look at some of the interesting stuff that they've found with the History Channel, if you look at the lower left, you've got these um, giant blocks of stone that are buried under the sea or submerged under the sea. And it has been determined that those rectangular blocks point directly toward the money pit. Now, the History Channel guys are, did not actually discover them. They more rediscovered them. They went down, they explored them. Uh, it, it now takes a dive since uh, the beach at the uh, end of Smuggler's Cove is a little deeper now. It actually took a dive, but they went down and explored them. They do point toward the money pit. Now, having done that, uh, if you just think about, you've got something on that side of the island that is pointing toward the money pit. You see it there, the arrow coming from Smuggler's Cove. And you've got something on the south side of the island, that triangle that's pointing toward the money pit. And you know those things are there. You now know where the money pit is. So there is that. The History Channel has discovered many other things. They also discovered coconut fibers. They took them to a laboratory. They had them uh, scientifically uh, examined and determined they are in fact coconut fibers. They have found some small bones, which I think have turned out to be uh, small animal bones in borehole 10X and many other things, including some coins that they have discovered. They, they found the coin you see on your left and of course, the History Channel being what it is and hyping everything indicated that this was the most significant thing that had ever been discovered on Oak Island, when in fact there had been other coins also discovered on Oak Island. And you see one of them there on your right. So they have the History Channel, the Sky Channel, they have made uh, some very interesting discoveries uh, in their search for this treasure. One of the most interesting, and of course, they left it as a seasoned cliffhanger. They are also during, doing core drillings. And at the very end of season four, I think it was, they drilled down and they pulled up what you see in front of you right now. They pulled up a core that if you look at the very left picture, had cement on the top of it. And then it had horizontal wood underneath that cement and then vertical wood underneath the horizontal wood. And if you look at the picture on the right, you see what they think they had drilled into was something with a cement covering and then the top of a box that would of course have horizontal <laughs> wood on it. And then they figure they drilled right into the corner where they got that vertical wood. And of course, the entire audience had to wait a year to find out what they had drilled into, hoping that it was the chest that was covered in concrete that was discovered earlier. So when they finally got around to it, following seas, here's what we discovered. That other things they brought up from that area had those strange markings on it that you see on your right. Those turned out to be circular saw markings. There were no circular saws in 1795 or previous. So they determined what they had really dug into with that core was the work of somebody else, the remnants of maybe a toolbox or something like that. So it really turned out to be kind of a false alarm. And there have been a lot of false alarms on the History Channel show. Again, not trying to belittle them, um, and it, it's not so much the Lagina brothers that are doing all this hyping, but it's the History Channel and the way they present their programs. And at about this time, um, I got one of those now famous tweets off of Twitter from somebody I follow. 
And she sent me this. And she said, watching this show on the History Channel is like watching Geraldo Rivera dig into Al Capone's vault over a period of four years. Now, if you're not familiar with that, probably back sometime in the 90s, this journalist, Geraldo Rivera, uh, had a show where live on TV, he dug into Al Capone's vault expecting to find treasure. And of course, they hyped it for weeks and weeks and weeks that this was gonna be on live. And when he got in there, he found absolutely nothing. So she compared it to that show only stretched over four years. Well, here we are. We've got all this stuff that we have found and we, you really need to kind of take everything that we've looked at here and say of all these things, what is fact? What is fiction? What is conjecture? Can we, can we at least kind of sort it out that way? And if we kind of look through it, if you take a look at the stuff that I have in gold or yellow there, they're pretty much things that are, are really true. You know, uh, they have found coconut fiber. They've found metal and bone and coins and other things that you might somehow refer to as treasure uh, that we know for sure now that that cove is man-made and we don't know why. But other things that, that they think they found is really at least speculation, if not out and out conjecture. Uh, the fact that there was a booby trap, we just don't know. The fact that the Knights Templar may have been on the island, hard to prove things that they found in borehole 10x. Uh, they, it just doesn't look like that is true at all. And of course, the cipher stone, which nobody can find uh, at all. I think if they found the cipher stone, that would really be significant. So the question becomes, is there treasure on this island? The things that they found, you could say, yes, that's that's kind of treasure. I really love the fact that they have found this stuff. But the real question is, is there significant treasure on the island? So what we see here is a recap of all the researchers that have kind of been through the area in depth and what they think about the island and where they think any treasure might be built. I won't go into all of them. Most of them, I think, think there's something in the money pit. But the one thing you've got to notice is there's not a one of these guys on this list that thinks there is no treasure. They're, they are all convinced that there's a treasure there somewhere. Now, Fred uh, Nolan, number five, uh, actually lived on the island. He has also passed away. Uh, but I just thought I would point out that he was a resident of the, of the island, one of the people that owned property there. So there are three additional researchers that have done some very extensive work here. Uh, here's your recap of everything we just saw. And these three guys, um, I'm, I'm telling you, and I will point you towards their research. They have done a lot of it and they've got their own theory about what may be going on on Oak Island. And before I tell you what it is, I'll tell you a couple things. Number one, I don't think you're gonna hear about this on the History Channel uh, at all. And number two, I, I've got to point out again how thorough their research is, but I want to say don't kill the messenger because I'm only reporting what they think. And then we'll clarify what their theory is after we just knock you over the head with it, which is that what's going on on Oak Island is a Masonic hoax. Now, First of all, because, just because there's a hoax going on on Oak Island does not necessarily mean 
that there's no treasure there. These three guys are Richard Joltz, Joe Nickel, and Dennis King. And Dennis King is in fact a Freemason and together or separately, both, uh, they, they have various skills and they have done uh, various researches and come up with their conclusion. Now, all I can do is say this, don't take my word for this. Uh, Google their names and you will eventually wind up at page after page of uh, research that they have done really detailed about what is going on at Oak Island. Now, let's take a look at this Masonic hoax thing because we don't like hearing it's a Masonic hoax, do we? So here's what they really think happened there. They do not believe the Masons started this. They believe that it started out as what you would call a money digging scam. Money digging is where uh, a guy will go into an area and he'll start digging. And the people in the area will want to know what he is doing. And he will tell them that he has proof that there is a treasure buried down there. And that if they will invest in his dig, he will make them a part of this whole thing and they will profit from what he's doing. They, they will get a part of what he digs up. And then the people invest in that money dig. And then of course, the guy who started it skips town. So they think that somebody began like that. And by the way, uh, Joseph Smith, who started the Mormon church was not only accused of this, he admitted doing it and he was kind of proud of it. That's how he got money for the church. It was very common back then. Now, here's where they think the Masons come in. They took a look at the things that we've just seen about Oak Island and what was going on there and they started to see where there could be parallels between the Masonic degrees and Oak Island. And then they have a whole section on when all of this stuff that we've looked at actually came about. In other words, they didn't just say start that dig in 1795 and the boys run out and say, we found flagstones. The flagstones, as you see there, were never heard of until 1864. The cipher stone story, never heard until about the same time. That whole thing about the, the concrete block with the iron ring in it, it was almost 100 years later that they started talking about that, that there's any mention of it at all. It also was a hundred years later that anybody started ever in any way talking about a stone triangle being there, that they ever started talking about finding parchment in that one core dig. And <clears throat> the, the other two things, uh, the point within the circle, this is when they were discovered. However, they seem to be pretty real thing, real things. But the point is, there's the, these researchers are saying that they have dug out information that says all of those things that we've been thinking came about with Oak Island right straight from the beginning did not even, we didn't even hear of them until in some cases a century later. So there you have it. Now, we've been at this over 220 years and you look at the whole Oak Island thing and you say, what do we have? Well, we've got a few tantalizing artifacts. We've seen them in this presentation. We have countless theories about what might be going on there. We've also got a whole lot of questions about everything that is occurring on Oak Island that we just really have not put this thing to bed, have we? There is so much that we still don't know about what's going on on that little island off of Nova Scotia. But there's one thing that we do know. The Freemasons 
have been involved. Allegedly. Brother, that sort of wraps up my thoughts on Oak Island, and I guess I will throw it back to Gordon now. Uh, I will. There, there's a book out on Amazon that uh, this is a long presentation, and I've taken a lot out of it, and you know, the rest of it's in the book, and I'm not trying to sell a book, but if you're interested, it's out there in both Kindle and paperback form. Gordon, I'm going to turn it back to you and try to get my screen back here. Brother Steve Harrison, Thank you so much on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our guests this evening on, as one brother has just said, a fantastic demolition of a conspiracy theory. Uh, what an interesting story. What an interesting journey. And uh, for someone who's been intrigued uh, with the, the Legina brothers spending all their billions of pounds in that hole over the last few years, uh, you've certainly uh, brought some sanity or reality back to, to my thinking. But yeah, it's entertainment, I suppose. Uh, let me just see if I can unshare your screen. I stop participant sharing this. So there, there we, we go. go. Now I can see you guys. So, Steve, we do have some, some questions for you. Uh, let me just scroll back up here. Uh, see where this starts. There was one question that I did see when did concrete first come around and uh, a few of our intelligent brain uh, told us it was the Roman era. Uh, Steve Chalmers comments about Rosalind Chapel. It was not built then. It was built circa 1440. And if you do get over, Steve, uh, as you were hoping to do last year, but the COVID pandemic stopped that, uh, we've got a few experts uh, within this group on Rosalind Chapel that we can certainly put you in touch with to give you the, the real tour uh, and not the, the Masonic tour uh, of Rosalind Chapel. I. Uh, Gorgeous Paul, I hope you're doing well, Paul, I uh, asks, would dating the three trees fit in with the timelines? Do you know, Steve? Did the trees fit in with the timelines? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not certain what that means. So the, the, I think he's asking, you talked about the three trees around the sinkhole, right. and were they ever dated, uh, the, the age of the trees? I have never ran into anything that said the age of those specific trees were dated. Of course, they're obviously gone now. And if they wouldn't have been, uh, the History Channel would have taken care of that with the digging they've done in the area. Yeah. I do not know anything about the age of the trees. I have been told they were oak trees. Okay, thank you. Ian Kennedy asks, where do the nearest locals live? Is there a Masonic connection? So where is the, the nearest Masonic lodge? In uh, Nova Scotia, there, I, I know there's no Masonic Lodge right there uh, on the island. I'm certain there are Masonic Lodges in um, Halifax and on the show. I don't know how far into the show you guys are. Uh, they've had many, many Freemasons come on and uh, talk about their theories there as well. They're very close. Uh, Freemasons are very close to the island. Yeah, you, you see them with uh, baseball hats on, with the square yeah. and compasses, getting interviewed and everything, you see. Uh, interesting talk. Superb demolition of conspiracy. Brilliant. Uh, a very entertaining talk. Some of the plaudits coming through. Uh, superb. Any, the debunking of the scam. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Sandy Thompson asks, do we know the relative level of the bottom of the pit to sea level? Was a smuggler's tunnel never discovered? That I know of, no tunnel has been discovered. They keep doing a lot of work out there on uh, Smith's Cove or Smuggler's Cove, where what actually, uh, to go back to the three people I talked about, they believe that what goes out to Smith's Cove is not a tunnel or anything like that. They think it is uh, a what they call a salt works. So they have found drains out in Smith's Cove uh, that point out like you know five fingers. And 
they claim that this is very similar to what the way you would build something uh, for a salt work, in other words, to extract salt from the ocean. And that's what the quote booby trap tunnel or whatever would have been used for at the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's quite a, a, a witty quote for you, Steve. Uh, excellent, Steve. Keep digging. Alan Maitland's wallet is still to be found. And that's a reference to one of our brethren uh, here uh, in our audience. I, that could also be called a Masonic hoax that Alan Maitland has actually got a wallet that he shares around. Sorry, Alan. Uh, do the Laguna Brothers own Oak Island? And how do they finance this huge operation? They do not own Oak Island. There are actual residents on Oak Island. Uh, they may have bought a lot on Oak Island and it is clearly financed by the History Channel and the History Channel's deep pockets and the History Channel's advertisers. I think they, they, they made their money in, in oil and stuff, but they, they, they're billionaires, now, I believe. Oh, uh, they, they are very successful businessmen. There's no doubt about that, but they're not personally financing this thing. No. Uh, Steve Chalmers comments about the Friends of Roslyn Chapel Trust uh, as a, a good resource for information. And Brother Jim Monroe, Passmaster 606, uh, as another good source for information on Roslyn Chapel. Uh, may I, Gordon, may I ask you, did one of your comments say that as opposed to what's in the presentation, that Roslyn Chapel, that that the 1398 era predates Roslyn Chapel? Yep, a uh, Rosalind Chapel from 1440, I think. Steve okay, I, I, yeah. will, um, I, I will make that change and I'll look into it. And uh, I do know there's also the theory, like if you read John Robinson's book, um, that still those Knights Templar went up to your area. Yeah. In fact, I think his theory is that's where the Freemasons came from, which I don't think a lot of people accept. No, I think uh, Bob Cooper does a really good book of debunking the Roslyn hoax as well. Oh, by uh, the way, I I, uh, I don't know that he would remember me. I do know Bob Cooper. Uh, I've had uh, dinner with him and breakfast uh, one year when he came here to speak to our Lodge of Research. Mm -hmm. Fine individual. Yeah, and uh, we, we do have a, a Templar legacy in Scotland. You still, we still have Templar graves, uh, but it's that Masonic connection that I think most right-thinking Masons I uh, know to be rather tenuous, uh, but it's a good myth. Uh, uh, Aubrey Winnie, it could be that uh, someone made so much effort for nothing. There must be, it could not be that someone made so much effort for nothing. There must be something buried there. You would like to hope so, Audrey, Aubrey. Another comment about Rosalind, uh, a mystery is a viable treasure. It rebuilt Roslyn Chapel and Oak Island, a television series of several years. What a treasure. That in itself, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Ian Walk. Fascinating lecture. Well presented. It all reminds me of a story about Rosyth Dockyard during the war. Uh, an MOD, that's our Ministry of Defence uh, policeman, Steve, was tipped off that a certain lorry driver was stealing dockyard equipment and driving it out in his lorry. The policeman made a point of stopping the driver in his lorry every time he was leaving and searched the man in his vehicle but could never find anything. This went on throughout the war. After the war, the MOD copper happened to meet the driver in a pub in Dunfermline and challenged him saying, I know you were thieving, but I could never catch you. What were you taking? The driver replied, yes, you're right. I was nicking lorries. Maybe it's oak trees that are buried on Oak Island. Hmm. You see. That's quite good for you, Ian. Well done. Uh, what has been shown is not unlike how we used to cap a mine shaft in Scotland. Uh, are the Laguna brothers in the craft? Do you know, Steve? They are not. Now, he, here's a, a personal question to you, Steve. Do you believe the Knight Templars got to the US before Columbus? Um, I wouldn't... Uh disputed. I want to see a lot of evidence. I think there's been some on the show. Um, 
I kind of consider myself a scientist and I want to see hard data. And, and I think there may be some of that. Okay, interesting. Now, that is not to be interpreted that I think they got to Oak Island and buried a treasure. No, no, we could accept that one. Uh, Steve Chalmers, I, again, about the Roslyn area, there was a castle at uh, the location used for the present chapel until the Battle of Roslyn in 1303. So there was uh, fortifications or buildings of sorts. Uh, Bob Potter, congratulations, Steve Harrison. Many thanks for your talk. Like many, I watched the series for months, then gave up, disappointed at the lack of disclosures. Did you write the commentary? Only kidding. So I think you've played that well and you had us on the hook right to the very end. Uh, Laird Allen Maitland uh, has to go to plan his revenge. Uh, Ian Kennedy tells us there's a strong Knights Templar linked to Glam's. Uh, they have containers, KT containers in the Lodge Museum. Uh, Eagle Earl Mortensen is a uh, one of our brethren from Newfoundland uh, tells us every Sunday, Grand Lodge of Nova Scotia have a meeting uh, with the, the Grand Master live chat. Uh, so we can join that. Excellent presentation. Well, Brian, that's the end of the questions in there. Steve Harrison, once again, on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Gratchy, thank you so much, sir, for joining our lockdown lecture series. Uh, you have followed in Brother Bob Cooper's footsteps as he was our first presenter in this series way back in March 2020. Uh, and it's been a, a great pleasure having you here this evening. Thank you, sir. I am honoured you asked me. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Brian, next week we, we're staying with our uh, American brethren uh, and we have got Brother Moses Gomez coming back. And Moses will talk to us about Freemasonry in Cuba. Uh, I'm sure some of you, many of us have heard Moses' presentations, so I'm certain next Tuesday evening will be another fantastic night. So on behalf of everyone here at 337, Bern, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week. Please unmute and say your thank yous and give your own personal appreciations to the work of Brother Steve Harrison this evening. Thank you, Brian. Well done, Steve. Enjoy well, well, that well, immensely. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, well, Steve. Well done, Steve. Thank you. program I'm going to have to watch. Well done. Excellent, Brother Steve. Thanks very much, Brother Steve. Thank you. Brother Steve. Well done, Brother Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank that very much. Thanks, thank Brother Gordon, Brother too. Steve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother Steve. Thanks, Steve. Obviously, a lot of work in your presentation. Uh, that, that's what I call uh, a man that's devoted to the subject. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Brother Steve, that was absolutely super. Thank you very much for that. Brother Steve, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It certainly gave us all food for thought, hasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Brother Steve. It's absolutely riveted and really enjoyed that lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. Night, brethren. Good night. Steve, safe. As, uh, as uh, Halifax and uh, Grand Lodge of Nova Scotia is pretty close to Oak Island. Readings with the History Channel, or uh, yeah, know anything, something about it, but uh, should, should be interesting to uh, listen on Sunday. Yeah, I'll give you five, Brown. Take care. Hey, all good night. And four, Brown. Good night, brother, and stay safe. Thank you. Good night. And three. Right. Good night, everyone. Thanks very much, Gordon. Thank you. Here's in. And two, Thanks, Brian. Gordon. Night, Audrey. Good night, Jen. Excellent. Again. Gordon, thank you for putting this up for us. Pleasure. Pleasure. Right. And one. Thank you thank so you, much, brother Steve Harrison, once again. <laughs>